Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, for coming back to the Montgomery County Council. Item number five on our agenda uh, begins our public hearing. This is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY21 capital budget and amendment to the FY21-26 capital improvements program for the Department of Housing and Community Affairs in the amount of $8 million for the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund. A Fed committee work session will be scheduled at a future date. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on January 19th. Each individual will have two minutes to speak. Individuals will be alerted as they approach their two minutes and may be disconnected. Also, there may be technical glitches during the public hearing that may need to be addressed by our staff. So thanks in advance for your patience. Ms. Kennedy, do we have speakers for this public hearing? Yes, we do. Our first speaker for this public hearing is Asim Nagam. Mr. Magan, you have two minutes when you begin. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. My name is Asim Nagam, Director of the Department of Housing and Community Affairs. I'm here on behalf of the County Executive in support of the Supplemental Capital Project Appropriation for the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund. This appropriation is needed because the county has a severe shortage of affordable housing and needs to move quickly to keep naturally occurring affordable housing as affordable for the longer term and needs to maximize and leverage private investment in the preservation and creation of dedicated affordable housing. The recent Montgomery planning studies like the housing needs assessment and the preservation studies shed light on the scope of our housing affordability challenges as well as the opportunities like the Opportunity Fund. This appropriation of county funds will support DHCA in working with the private sector to create and leverage a dedicated pool of revolving short-term financing that will enable developers to respond quickly to opportunities to acquire properties at risk of loss of affordability and position them for longer-term affordability. This short-term financing once repaid from long-term financing will become available to support additional acquisitions of affordable housing. Many other jurisdictions already are pursuing the approach like the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund. Also, the Opportunity Fund will relieve pressure on the Housing Initiative Fund for acquisition purpose and the HIF could solely be used for long-term financing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nagam. Our next speaker is Mary Kolar. She will have four minutes because she is speaking on two items, two other items, eight and nine. Ms. Kolar, you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Kolar and I am testifying on behalf of Montgomery Housing Alliance. MHA appreciates the opportunity to testify today on three measures before the council, an appropriation to the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund, Bill 4920 and Bill 5120. First, MHA supports a supplemental appropriation of at least $8 million for the proposed Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund. We strongly encourage you to increase the appropriation to the level originally requested by the County Executive, $10 million in each of two years. Establishing the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund and funding it at this level will enable the County to leverage an additional $60 to $80 million in new non-county capital, providing critically needed acquisition dollars for affordable housing development. As housing providers and advocates, MHA members recognize the acute need for affordable housing in our region. In 2018, there was a gap of 48,000 units affordable to households with incomes at or below 50% of the area median income. Prior to the pandemic, half of tenants in Montgomery County were already cost burdened. Over the past several months, need has only deepened. We applaud the council's commitment to affordable housing programs, including emergency rental assistance, and your unanimous affirmation of the housing targets identified in the 2019 Council of Governments report. In order to make meaningful progress toward meeting these targets, longer-term bond financing that will provide takeout funds for loans obtained through the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund is also needed. We strongly urge you to pair a $10 million allocation toward the acquisition fund with a $50 million bond for affordable housing preservation and development especially along the Purple Line Corridor. Robustly funding these measures will provide ready resources to purchase and preserve affordable housing. This is critical in order to stem further loss of affordable units and to produce new units at the magnitude required to address growing needs. MHA also supports Bill 4920, the Housing Justice Act, which would allow many households greater access to housing and address some of the longstanding racial and economic inequities in the county's housing markets. 
People of color are disproportionately affected by poverty and disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system. It is crucial to ensure that involvement with the justice system does not in and of itself create a barrier to housing. Nearly one in three Americans has a criminal record. In Montgomery County, we already face a critical scarcity of affordable housing. Failure to eliminate additional barriers to housing puts justice-involved individuals at much greater risk of homelessness and subsequent recidivism. We do want to call your attention to special circumstances pertaining to housing organizations that serve vulnerable individuals. Specifically, we request that language be inserted to ensure that nothing in this law shall interfere with such organizations' processes of conducting criminal background checks, including the timing thereof, as part of the assessment process to identify needs for therapeutic and other support services to further housing stabilization. MHA commends council members Kathleen Glass and the co-sponsors of the Housing Justice Act for their leadership on this critical issue. As the council examines and strives to address the impacts of racial and economic injustice, one clear step is to decriminalize poverty. We must ensure that those with low-level nonviolent offenses, especially survival crimes and offenses linked to poverty and homelessness, do not face additional barriers to housing. Quality affordable housing stabilizes communities. Fostering access to housing, both through measures like the Housing Justice Act and by increasing the supply of affordable housing is necessary so all people in Montgomery County, especially low-income people and people of color can not only survive, but thrive. Lastly, MHA supports Bill 5120, which would establish important standards for child safety by requiring window guards in certain rental units. We encourage the county to careful, carefully implement the, the measure, including providing funding to defray negative impacts on housing providers. Thank you for the opportunity to provide input as you consider these measures. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Diana Eisenstadt. Ms. Eisenstadt, you may begin. Can you unmute yourself, please? We see your videos on, but we need you to unmute, please. Did you get it unmuted? Yep. Great. Diana Eisenstadt, Executive Director of the Affordable Housing Conference of Montgomery County. We welcome the opportunity to lend our support for the $8 million appropriation for the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund. Pre-pandemic, nearly 50% of Montgomery County residents were housing burdened. With rental and mortgage arrearages continuing to increase as unemployment rates remain high, we strongly recommend restoring the initially proposed $10 million appropriation. This is an investment we cannot afford not to make. Montgomery County and jurisdictions across the country have long faced an affordable housing crisis. The pandemic has laid bare the disparate impact of inadequate housing on the health and well being of low income residents and communities of color. Revolving funds that provide both leverage and bridge financing to secure long term funding are essential to sustaining dedicated affordable housing properties. There are numerous models of public, private, and not for profit sector partnerships in our region. Enterprises Equitable Path Forward and JBG Smith's Washington Housing Initiative, to name a couple, offering great potential to address the affordable housing crisis. The level of investment needed to get and keep people housed calls for partnerships and a multi-pronged approach. To that end, AHCMC also strongly encourages the council and the county executive to approve the $50 million bond financing proposed for the Housing Production Fund and the $50 million bond financing proposed for the affordable housing along the Purple Line Corridor. If we are to meet housing needs of our residents and especially vulnerable populations pursuing uh, investments through a variety of platforms and relationships will be imperative to ensuring a thriving community. We're grateful for your commitment to identifying solutions to the affordable housing crisis plaguing our community and in keeping with the county's stellar reputation, we urge you to approve the $10 million appropriation for the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund and the $100 million in bond financing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jeffrey Mosley, and he will also be speaking on item number nine, so he will have four minutes. Mr. Mosley, you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council President Hucker and members of Montgomery County Council. My name is Jeff Mosley. I am the Chief Real Estate Officer of Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless and Director of its affiliate Coalition Homes. MCCH provides solutions in Montgomery County to ensure that homelessness is rare, brief, and non-reoccurring. This mission is underscored by our vision to build a community where everyone has a safe, stable, and affordable place to call home. 
Coalition Home, Coalition Homes' mission is to expand the supply of permanent supportive housing. We own and provide 186 permanent supportive housing for families struggling with homelessness. These families are largely with incomes at or below 30% of area median income. I'm testifying in support of the creation and supplemental appropriation of the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund, but I'm also testifying in support of the idea for, but seek more information on the guidance on Bill 5120 regarding the window guards. The Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund will provide critical platform to hasten the acquisition and preservation of dwellings that might otherwise become unaffordable, particularly when we critically need these resources. While we support the supplemental appropriation of 8 million for FY21 and 6 million for FY22, we strongly encourage that the council consider capitalizing the fund at 10 million annually to help leverage approximate, approximately 60 to 80 million dollars to acquire properties dedicated to affordable housing. Coalition Homes will apply for these funds to acquire properties uh, to develop over 90 permanent supportive housing over the coming years for people with no to very low incomes. We expect to utilize the Department of Housing and Community Affairs Affordable Housing Opportunity and the HIF funds, along with non-public capital um, and the proposed $50 million bond for affordable housing development and preservation to acquire and preserve these um, housing opportunities. We will likely undertake this pursuing MPDUs and small multifamily properties. These resources will help ensure that coalition homes and other affordable housing developers will have access to capital with the necessary rates and terms to meet the growing need for low wealth residents. With regards to Bill 5120, we generally support uh, and appreciate the, um, the bill. We, we do request more information and clarification on, um, on the bill and its elements and definitely strongly encourage the council to consider creating a fund to help defray the cost for the implement the installation purchase installation and the compliance ongoing compliance that the bill um, uh, will will likely bring while we understand um, that this is going to be something that's going to have benefit for families and landlords um, so there will be not we won't have any unforeseen disasters that we've seen, for example, in Tacoma Park. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is John Poxtis, and he will also be speaking to item number eight, and he will have four minutes. Mr. Poxtis, you may begin. Okay, good afternoon. My name is John Poxtis. I'm the president and CEO of Habitat for Humanity Metro Maryland. I'm testifying today in, su in support of supplemental appropriation for the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund, Bill 4920, the Housing Justice Act, and Bill 5120, Window Guards. Habitat for Humanity strongly supports the supplemental appropriation of at least $8 million for the creation of Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund. Habitat also urges the council to consider increasing the appropriation to the originally requested amount of $10 million in, one, in year one and $10 million in year two. It is estimated that funding at that level could leverage between 60 and $80 million in private dollars. The need for affordable housing is acute and has only been magnified by our current health crisis. Between 2010 and 2017, the county lost more than 27,000 housing units that uh, rented under $1,500. We applaud the council for its commitment to meet the housing shortfall projections laid out in the Council of Governments report. In order to produce more than 23,000 affordable units, we need to make more funding available while thinking creatively about how we can bring in new partners to leverage public dollars. The Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund is one way to use public dollars to leverage private investment in housing. That said, we must also provide robust funding for the Housing Initiative Fund to ensure a quick takeout strategy so that short-term acquisition dollars can be uh, resolved, revolved. Habitat would like to see the acquisition fund paired with the $50 million bond supporting the preservation and development of affordable housing with a focus on areas around the Purple Line. Regarding Bill 4920, the Housing Justice Act, 
Habitat strongly supports the Housing Justice Act and believes that the bill is an important step in providing equitable, house, equitable access to housing. This act will prohibit discrimination in rental housing against individuals convicted of nonviolent, low-level uh, crimes that are often associated with poverty and homelessness. Justice-involved individuals uh, currently experience high levels of discrimination, making it more difficult to find safe, adequate, and affordable housing because of their criminal record. This increases the likelihood of homelessness and recidivism. Moreover, people of color experience poverty and interaction with the criminal justice system at a disproportionately higher rate than are unduly affected by this type of housing discrimination. Decriminalizing poverty and homelessness is an important step in ensuring that all members of our community have equitable access to quality housing. As the bill is considered, Habitat encourages the council to include language ensuring the law does not interfere with housing organizations that serve vulnerable individuals. These organizations have processes of conducting checks with timing critical to the assessment process of identifying needs for therapeutic and other support services to further housing stabilization. Regarding Bill 5120, window guards, Lastly, Habitat voices its support for Bill 5120 the requiring window guards and rental units in certain circumstances. Especially after a number of tragic events, we must take steps to protect the safety of children living in rental housing by ensuring that families requesting window guards have unimpeded access, access to them. Habitat recommends that during the implementation of this bill, fire safety and escape be carefully considered. Uh, while window guards are an important safety measure in protecting small children, they should not hinder fire escape exits. Moreover, Habitat recommends the Council consider providing funding to help with the implementation of this bill. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused economic devastation on many families and rental units. In many Poxis, cases, excuse me, your time is up. Under. Mr. Poxis, your time is up. My apologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Noah Hale. Mr. Hale, you may begin. All right, does my sound work? Yes, we hear you. Thank you. Hi there, uh, my name is Noah Hale. I'm a resident of Montgomery County. Uh, most people know me as the, the Director of Development for Team Associates, who's a affordable housing developer who's been based in Montgomery County for 40 years. I recently changed to Fairstead Development, who recently set up regional office uh, in Montgomery County. Uh, so there's a lot of activity um, and attention in, the, in this location right, right now. I'm speaking to testify in support of the Supplemental Housing Opportunity Fund. Uh, money towards affordable housing is always a good thing, um, but this specific type of money for acquisition is essential uh, because uh, what this allows uh, developers, both for-profit, non-profit, all developments are public-private uh, uh, developments, it allows us to compete because to maintain affordable rents in Montgomery County, you have to uh, acquire a property at an affordable price. Um, and those are the those acquisitions uh, are really, really competitive. Uh, so it's a funding source like this uh, that's paired in leverage against private capital that is really going to uh, allow uh, a lot of units to be able to be preserved. You don't have to go that far in our region to see what happens to counties who don't implement programs like this. So this is a very proactive um, uh, program that I support uh, and both Fairstead and Team Associates supports. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Holly Deniston Chase. Ms. Chase, you may begin. Good afternoon. Thank you all for your time. As I said, my name is Holly Deniston Chase. I work at Lyft Low Income Investment Fund uh, and I'm also a Montgomery County resident. I'd like to uh, agree with many of the comments that were made today and support my and, and voice my support for the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund. LIF, as well as Enterprise and other CDFIs have worked successfully with similar types of funds across the country in California, New York City, Atlanta, and other areas to help support affordable housing and other community development activities whether they are transit oriented or other uh, locations. Funds are a very good way to leverage government funding 
with CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, Capital and Bank Capital. These funds, uh, as Noah and others have said, allow developers, both nonprofit and for-profit, to acquire properties quickly, affordably, um, and preserve them while those developers are securing permanent financing, whether that's low-income housing tax credits or other permanent financing. During that holding period, the county developers, CDFI lenders, and others can provide support to structure those permanent financing options to best suit county needs and developer needs. For example, ensuring to inc uh, inclusion of supportive housing or family units or units for seniors. So this holding period uh, is very important so that developers and county can come together to form a, a long lasting sustainable project. This fund structure is critical for making that hold period possible. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. President. That wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Thank you so much, Ms. Kennedy. Agenda item six is a public hearing on the special appropriation to the county government's FY21 operating budget in the amount of $2,500,000 for the conference center non-departmental account. A Fed committee work session. Oh, I'm beg your pardon. Um, Council member Reamer, chair of the Fed committee wanted to comment on the previous testimony. Thank you, Mr. Council President. I just wanted to thank everyone for their testimony and appreciate the references to the uh, additional affordable housing funding that we're working on and want to say our plan is to take everything up together at the Fed committee as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry for my faulty memory. So agenda item six is a public hearing on a special appropriation to the county government's FY21 operating budget in the amount of $2,500,000 for the conference center non-departmental account. A Fed committee work session will be scheduled at a future date. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on January 19th. Ms. Kennedy, is it still true there's no speakers for this hearing? That's correct, no speakers. Great. Um, agenda item seven is a public hearing on Bill 4720, Ethics, Ethics Commission Conflicts of Interest Financial Disclosure Amendments. This bill would require employees to attend a public ethics training course, amend the law governing appeals of a decision by the Ethics Commission, amend the law governing the Ethics Commission's resolution of complaints, modify the restrictions on a public employee's participation in certain matters, repeal an exception to the restrictions on outside employment for an elected official, clarify an exception to soliciting or accepting certain small gifts, modify the procedures for administering the financial disclosure process, and generally amend the law governing public ethics. A GEO committee work session is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, January 27th, 2021. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on January 20th. If you would like to follow the progress of a council bill, the council website has a subscribe function. Go to the council website and use the view council records and legislative updates link to learn more. Ms. Kennedy, do we have speakers for this public hearing? Yes, we do. The first speaker for this public hearing is Robert Cobb. Mr. Cobb, you may begin. You have two minutes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, again, I'm Robert Cobb, and I'm counsel to and staff director of the Montgomery County Ethics Commission. On behalf of the Montgomery County Ethics Commission, I want to thank Council Member Katz for introducing Bill 4720 on behalf of the commission. The commission also thanks Council Member Friedson for his initiative in connection with recently enacted Bill 4220. Through coordination with Council Member Friedson's office and with the assistance of Council staff, particularly Mr. Drummer, Bill 4720 was crafted in a manner that avoids any overlap with Bill 4220. Bill 4720 improves a number of provisions of existing law and introduces a requirement that all compensated public employees who file financial disclosure reports receive ethics training on set schedules with all other employees to receive training at such times as determined by the Ethics Commission. This provision is intended to ensure that all county employees are informed of what the public ethics law requires of them. The provisions of the bill addressing appeals and handling of complaints largely codifies existing interpretations, including court decisions of law and provides greater flexibility to the commission in the handling of complaints. The bill also carves out from coverage of the conflicts of interest provision certain assets regarding which the commission believes there is no threat of actual conflict of interest. 
The bill deletes an exemption from the outside employment restrictions and requirements for a council member's outside employment held at the time elected to county service. The commission believes this exemption enacted when council positions were considered part-time subverts the objectives of the ethics law and the people's right to public officials who are impartial. The remainder of the bill can be considered technical in nature without substantially affecting ethics requirements and the more uh, detailed written submission explains these changes. Thank you for the privilege of speaking to you today. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Our next speaker for this public hearing is Tesh Dariba. Mr. Dariba, you may begin. Tesh Dariba. I see them there, but they are not taking them, taking themselves off mute or putting themselves on camera. So I'm not sure if there's a technical problem and that would wrap up our speakers for this public hearing, Mr. President. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Um, agenda item eight colleagues is a public hearing on bill 4920, the human rights and civil liberties, discrimination and rental housing, fair criminal history and credit screenings, housing justice act. This bill would prohibit a landlord from raising a, a stated rent in certain circumstances, require a rental application to contain certain information about record checks conducted by a housing provider, prohibit certain inquiries regarding criminal histories and rental housing applications, prohibit consideration of certain arrests and convictions in rental housing decisions, and generally amend the law regarding discrimination in housing and landlord tenant affairs. A joint public safety and Fed committee hearing work session is, general, is tentatively scheduled for Thursday, February 4th, 2021. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on January 29th. Ms. Kennedy, do we have speakers for this public hearing, please? Yes, we do. The first speaker for this public hearing is Christine Hong. Ms. Hong, you may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Christine Hong, and I'm the Director of Homeless Services at Interfaith Works. Our goal for every person we work with is for them to have housing, such a basic human right, and yet in many cases, it can be so elusive for the homeless population. Our team of case managers have found that being homeless and low income makes it much harder to rent an apartment. Half of those we serve in shelter have no income when they arrive, yet landlords are less likely to rent to them simply because they may have housing vouchers. This is illegal in Montgomery County, and yet it is a regular refrain we hear from landlords. As unjust as this is, it is not the only obstacle to housing for the homeless population. For those who are unsheltered, criminal charges like trespassing and public urination, among others, are too often given to those who are simply trying to survive outside because they don't have a home of their own. The sad reality is that homelessness continues to be criminalized. In 2020, Interfaith Works served over 1,000 people in our shelter and housing programs. More than 60% of those are Black, which makes homelessness an issue of racial equity. As our county pursues racial justice for its residents, it is imperative to address the causes of this disparity. We should not be a community that allows landlords to, not, to deny a family housing simply because they have a subsidy or to deny a person housing because they had no place to sleep or go to the bathroom. In the midst of this economic crisis, we must stand against discriminatory practices that prevent those most impacted from rebuilding their lives. We thank council members Glass and Katz for proposing the Housing Justice Act, Bill 4920, which would strengthen existing laws that make it illegal for landlords to discriminate based on income and also prohibit nuisance charges from being used to make housing decisions. We urge the full council to enact this important legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker for this public hearing is Alexandra Kurd. Ms. Kurd, you may begin your testimony. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Alexandra Kurd. I'm a resident of Silver Spring and a staff attorney with the Homeless Persons Representation Project also known as HPRP. HPRP is a legal nonprofit organization that offers free civil legal representation to people experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity here in Maryland. A major part of our mission is reducing barriers to accessing basic needs such as housing, food, and employment. 
As a society, we're finally waking up to the fact that arrest and criminal records are a significant barrier to housing and resources. This cycle continues because people who are experiencing homelessness often lived a more exposed life, making it more likely for them to have police interaction and therefore more likely to have a criminal record. My colleagues and I represent people who experience this harsh reality every day and guide them through the process of expunging their records so that they can be eligible for housing and other benefits. So many of my clients and those experiencing or utilizing our homeless services system here in Montgomery County could benefit from this bill. HPRP supports this bill with amendment. However, I believe the word amendment is strong. We just want to ensure that all arrest records for all offenses are consistently protected. Um, in 2016, uh, the uh, housing, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> HUD released guidance on the Fair Housing Act related to arrest records and is supported by Supreme Court precedent and advises, advises against the consideration of arrest records for any charge. However, Section G has an exception allowing landlords to consider certain arrests, and that would be inconsistent not only with this guidance and with Supreme Court precedent, but also with the spirit of the bill and in um, what we have what you all have established in the earlier section of the bill. So. HPRP is happy to support this bill. We just want to make sure that all arrest records are being um, protected in this. And so if the word arrest record can be removed from subsection G, HPRP will be happy to support this bill fully. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today, council members. Thank you very much for your testimony. The next speaker for this public hearing is Jeff Goldman. Mr. Goldman, you may begin your testimony. Great, thank you. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'm Jeff Goldman. I am the chair of the Interagency Commission on Homelessness. Uh, thank, to, thank you to the council for allowing me to uh, the opportunity to speak in support of Bill 4920. One of the most significant barriers to housing is a criminal record. In Montgomery County, Montgomery County issues more than 25% of all criminal citations in the state. Um, and People experiencing homelessness are often uh, receiving these citations disproportionately uh, for, for certain, certain of these citations. Life-sustaining activities like sleeping in public, loitering, public urination, um, when criminalized, do little to the, address the underlying needs of those experiencing homelessness and compound their difficulties. Arrests, criminal citations, and tickets often impose fines and fees that those experiencing homelessness are unable to pay, which may lead to open warrants or incarceration. Even when a criminal charge does not result in a conviction, such a dismissal under Maryland law can, under Maryland law, the charge remains in the criminal record, causing further barriers to housing, employment, and other life-sustaining resources. More than 60% of people experiencing homelessness are African-American. African-American residents are also likely to, more likely to enter the criminal justice system, receiving more than 47% of the state's criminal uh, citations in Montgomery County. Uh, the ICH supports this legislation, reducing barriers to housing and support um, helps us to achieve our goal of um, making sure that homelessness is something that is rare, brief, and non-recurring. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of Bill 4920. Thank you very much. Our next speaker for this public hearing is Faith Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, you may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Good afternoon, Council President Hucker and Council members. Thank you for holding this hearing to receive comments on Council Bill 4920, Human Rights and Civil Liberties, DG just the Housing Justice Act. The Montgomery County NAACP branch supports this proposed 4920 Housing Justice Act as sponsored by council member Glass and Katz. This legislation strengthens the current fair housing legislation, which does not compel landlords to explain disclosure requirements for criminal records or credit history. A landlord's failure to provide explanation for personal information refusing to provide explanations for applicant's rejection while refusing to allow a tenant to explain unfavorable information at best leads to the perception of discriminatory treatment and at worst may mask discriminatory practice. The NAACP has a long storied history 
in fighting housing discrimination in rental and sale of housing, giving these precarious and perilous times landlords and mortgage companies must take the necessary steps to eliminate practices that result in implicit and explicit discrimination. This county must enact, enact laws that de deconstruct the barriers to fair housing and work to replace systematic discrimination with systematic equity. While the nation has made significant strides in enacting laws that prevent housing discrimination, the coronavirus pandemic has cast a spotlight on the growing need for affordable housing, as well as the need to update our laws to increase fairness and equity in housing opportunities. Strengthening the fair housing legislation visa, via the Housing Justice Act is a step in the right direction by mandating transparency in rental applications and strengthening housing discrimination laws. And we support this Housing Justice Act. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker for this public hearing is Ashanti Martinez, and she will be speaking for four minutes also on item number nine. Ms. Martinez, you may begin your testimony. I'm sorry to disappoint, it is Mr. Martinez. Um, My apologies, good afternoon, I am so Council sorry. Chair Hucker. No, it is okay, it is okay. Um, good afternoon, Council Chair, uh, excuse me, President Hucker, as well as Council members. Um, CASA is here to register testimony in support of both Bill 4920, the Housing Justice Act, and Bill 5120. Uh, we at CASA believe that our mission is to create a more just society by building power and improving the quality of life in working class and immigrant communities. We believe that these bills aim to provide additional protections, move us closer to true housing justice, and overall strengthen the rights of renters. CASA is the region's largest community organization serving the immigrant community with a growing membership of over 100,000, over 20,000 of whom live across Montgomery County. And over the last 30 years, CASA has worked with hundreds of thousands of Marylanders on renters' rights issues through organizing advocacy and legal services. Bill 4920 establishes clear guidance to landlords that they should not do criminal background checks till a conditional offer is made to the tenant. This simple change will expand access to housing for many Montgomery County residents and put us on a path for greater housing access and opportunity for all. We know that communities of color are disproportionately represented in our criminal justice system, and Montgomery County isn't an exception. An Office of Legislative Overview report issued July of last year found that although Black and Latino persons accounted for 44% and 26% of all arrests made by Montgomery County police, they only represented 20 to 19% of actual county population. We at CASA believe housing is a human right, and if we truly want justice, we must remove the shackles that currently prohibit our unhoused and re-entering neighbors from the housing market. The county has already banned the box for employment. Now it's time for us to do the same for housing. We thank council members glad I'm losing. Mr. Martinez, you okay. might want to stop your video because we are losing, we are losing you. So if you could stop your video, then that would free up the stream. We're losing you. Okay, let me move somewhere with the Wi-Fi is somewhat better. Can you guys hear, hear you now? Yeah, now? we hear you clearly now. Yes, so you can pick up there. Is it better now? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, we'll just finish out on the last uh, paragraph, actually. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Bill 51 2020. We lost you again. about now. Okay, now we can hear you. Awesome. Okay, Bill 51 2020 is another simple example of how a simple solution could lead to saving lives. The common sense solution to require window guards on multifamily units could have led to 
making sure that small children in Montgomery County were still here with us. Uh, we thank Council President Hucker for his leadership in bringing forth this matter. Uh, CASA strongly both Bill 4920 and Bill 5120 and respectfully urges the Council to do the same. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And please accept my apologies again for my earlier mistake. Our next No, speaker, it always oh, happens. <laughs> thank you. Our next speaker is Susie Sinclair Smith. Ms. Sinclair Smith, you may begin your testimony. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm Susie Sinclair Smith, the CEO of the Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless, and I want to enthusiastically applaud um, the bills, Housing Justice Act co-sponsors, um, Council Member Evan Glass and Council Member um, Katz for introducing the Housing Justice Act, which um, will decrease the numbers of people experiencing homelessness in the county by reducing explicit discrimination um, against this population in the private housing market. Each year, MCCH supports 1,600 vulnerable men, women, and children, including 170 families with over 300 children, and we help them move into housing, while African Americans comprise 19% of county residents. 83% of our clients are persons of color, 65% identify as black, 18% identifies Latino. Um, th this is a stark picture of the impact of decades of racially discriminatory housing policies. Um, many of our clients have histories of involvement with the justice system. Landlords should evaluate housing applicants as individuals rather than explicitly excluding people with criminal records. Our, also, our clients have involvement with the justice system as a result of being homeless. This is cruel, but it also maintains a, a revolving door um, between homelessness. Um, in the last five years, we have seen a 48% reduction in homelessness. Um, this bill will serve to continue to um, keep, keep our efforts front and center in ending homelessness. In fact, when we were ending veteran and chronic homelessness, the last ones to be housed were those with criminal backgrounds. Um, this is evidence that our programs are working and our efforts to end homelessness for everyone in Montgomery County is well within reach with full support of our community and business leaders. The Housing Justice Act is an important step in fulfilling this goal and embracing our deep commitment to racial equity and social justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker for the public hearing is Edwin Archer. Mr. Archer, you may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. You need to unmute yourself. Please. Sorry about that. There you Good go. My name is Edwin you Archer, and I have been a resident of City of Rockville since 1992 and in Montgomery County since 1984. I have a bachelor's in animal science from the University of Maryland in, at College Park. I became homeless in February of 2019 and later became involved with the ICH People's Committee and the Coalition 180 around January of 2020. Uh, so it was around late September, early October of 2019, one early morning, I visited the McDonald's up Rockville Pike across close to Wintergreen Plaza. And uh, it was around 5.30 a.m. and I went there. Uh, I was homeless at the time, living out of a U-Haul. I went there because they had uh, wireless. Um, anyway, I get my coffee and I sit down and I'm, and I'm eating my breakfast and on my laptop on the internet. The shift supervisor comes in. I think she arrived around six o'clock and she takes a look at me. Then she walks around and 15 minutes later, she comes and tells me, you've been here a long time, you need to leave. I said, well, I'm, I'm here, I'm a customer. I purchased uh, you know, coffee and, and breakfast. And once I'm done eating, I'll leave. Uh, I continued to work. She left uh, another 20 minutes or so went around, went by, I go and get another coffee and another burrito, figuring I'm going to be there. I'm going to be a customer, not just quote unquote loiter. Uh, she comes back around, around 6.45, asked me to leave again. I said, ma'am, I'm still a customer and I'm still purchasing food. I have a right to be here. She says, if you don't leave, I'm going to take care of it. About 10 minutes later, a police officer pulls up and he walks into the store. He has a chat with her. Then he comes and talks to me. I realized what had happened. I, put, I, you know, I turned off my laptop and I told, and I tried to explain to the police officer what was going on. I said, I'm a customer. I'm, I'm purchasing stuff. I'm not just sitting here doing nothing uh, or distracting any customers or causing any uh, disturbance. And to, to make the point, there may have been like four other patrons in the store at that time. 
The officer said, well, if you don't leave, I'm going to arrest you. I told him I didn't say I wasn't going to leave. I was just trying to make the point that the manager is being discriminatory. And then I left. But he did indeed give me a trespass, uh, which I signed and then walked away and left in the U-Haul. Um, the conclusion, I am telling you the story so that you may understand how easy it is for somebody to get a criminal record or get arrested. Anyone can become homeless and anyone can have an arrest record or a criminal record. It is difficult enough in these times to find affordable housing in Montgomery County. For the unemployed, gaining, unemployed, gaining employment becomes much more difficult if you don't have a permanent or at least a temporary uh, address for housing. Mr. Roger, such as Mr. Roger, my apologies, my apologies for interrupting. In the way of an individual seeking uh, affordable housing in Montgomery County. Mr. Archer, I'm sorry to interject. Your time is up. We have to end the testimony. Thank you very much. Mr. President, that wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Thank you so much, Ms. Kennedy. Um, that concludes closes the testimony on item eight. And let me clarify that the testimony on items five, six, and seven are closed as well. Um, we are moving to agenda item nine. This is Mr. a public President. hearing. Yes, Mr. Glass. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Your pardon. Council member Glass wanted to speak. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I just wanted to express my appreciation to everybody uh, who took the time today to, to testify in support of this legislation that uh, Council Member Katz and I have introduced. Uh, and as, as, as we heard, Mr. Archer, particularly, I want to thank you uh, and the People's Committee, because it's your personal experience, it's your, your lived experience, uh, and the stories shared by the incredible nonprofit service providers who are doing this work day in and day out um, that were the inspiration for this legislation. So uh, it is just another testament that uh, the work that everyone here in Montgomery County is doing and all of our partners in the ICH, uh, we, we hear you. Uh, and uh, from, from your words and your situations, we, we take action. Uh, and we should not criminalize homelessness. And this legislation is just one more step to correct those injustices. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Council Member. Ms. Kennedy, do we still have testimony for item seven? Yes, we're going to check and see if Mr. Tesh Jariba is there. He's still on the line. Mr. Jariba, are you there to provide your testimony on um, item number seven? Okay, I do not see him there, so we can move on to number nine. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. So agenda item nine is a public hearing on Bill 5120, Landlord-Tenant Relations Window Guards. This bill would require the installation and maintenance of window guards in certain rental housing, require certain notifications to tenants, add lease requirements in certain circumstances, provide for the enforcement of window guard requirements, and generally amend the law regarding landlord-tenant relations. A Fed committee work session is tentatively scheduled for Monday, March 1st, 2021. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on February 22nd. Ms. Kennedy, Please uh, read the additional speakers for this hearing. The first speaker for this public hearing is Council Member Jarrett Smith. Mr. Smith, you may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Uh, can I start my video or? Yes, you may. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jarrett K. Smith, and I am the Ward 5 Council Member in Tacoma Park. I would like to thank Council President Hucker and his staff for all their efforts on this important piece of legislation. I want to make sure that I am clear that I am not speaking on behalf of the City Council, nor am I speaking on behalf of the City of Tacoma Park. I'm here giving remarks as a Ward representative. Ward 5 is the home of the former Washington Ventus Hospital Tacoma Park campus and the site of Washington Ventus University. Ward 5 has a large concentration of multifamily buildings which is why the window guard legislation is so important. Flower, Houston, and Roanoke Avenue is home to mostly garden style apartments, low rise multi-unit buildings, and previously single family homes that have been retrofitted into apartment buildings. I ask all of you to support the passage of the window guard legislation that is common to many cities throughout the US in areas with a high concentration of multi-unit buildings. 
Tacoma Park has been has seen two incidents in which one ended with the tragic loss of life of a child who fell to his death because there were not window guards in that three-story building. The parents of the young boy who lost his life are still too devastated from their loss and therefore unable to testify before the county council, which is one of the primary reasons I'm here today. I do not want to see another loss of life like this in our city or any other community in Montgomery County. I want to point out data from New York City's implementation of window guard regulation. A research report in the journal Injury Prevention said, the initial window guard rule that was passed in 1976 was associated, associated with a reduction in falls from 175 in 1977 to 47 in 1980. Overall, annual reported child window falls declined from 217 in 1976 to nine in 2016. And window fall deaths decreased from 24 to two. We as elected officials have opportunity to do something about this. Let's save lives and improve the quality of life for our residents. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. The next speaker for this public hearing is AJ Campbell. You may begin your testimony. Thank you. My name is uh, AJ Campbell. I'm a resident in Tacoma Park, and I'm also on the board of the Jewish Community Relations Council, whom have submitted written testimony supporting window guards. My child is alive today because New York required window guards. Before coming to Tacoma Park in 2007, I lived in Brooklyn where window guards are required and thank God they were. When my child first started walking, I called the landlord and he came over and installed the window guards. It took about 15 minutes. And one day my daughter reached for the window, but the guard stopped her from falling out. Tacoma Park, as uh, Council Member Smith has mentioned, has had two Window guard, a, win, a window guardless falls, um, and um, on one of the calls uh, right after little Ezekiel fell, um, sadly to his death, I reached out to the landlord of the building and I asked him to work with me to put window guards in. He was very polite, but he said he wouldn't unless the housing department weighed in first. If that was not the moment for this landlord to act, there was never going to be one. As you heard, um, uh, Council Member Smith has, speaking about window guards, what he didn't tell you is that he um, had offered to the City Council of Tacoma Park a, purchase, a bulk buy of window guards, which they failed to act on. Um, and when I approached Council Member, um, Council President Tom Hucker, uh, he was quick to act and I thank him for his efforts. Um, we require smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors and anti-tipping slides for stove and file supp fire suppression devices. It is impossible to think that we can't have window guards to save children. I can't make any landlord install window guards. I don't have that power, but you can make them. This council can make them. I wanna thank all the council members and specifically Council President Tom Hucker for your efforts. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Katie Donnelly. Dr. Donnelly, you may begin your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, uh, council members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Dr. Katie Donnelly, and I am a practicing emergency medicine physician at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. Children's National Hospital is the trauma center for children in this region, including Montgomery County, and it treats approximately 120,000 children each year. I'm also the medical director for Safe Kids DC, an organization dedicated to decreasing accidental childhood injury. I'm speaking to you today both with my role as an emergency medicine doctor and an injury prevention specialist and researcher. I am here to express my strong support for Bill 5120. Uh, as a pediatric emergency provider, I've seen firsthand the damage a fall from a window can do to a child. 
From broken bones to head injuries to intradominal bleeding, these injuries can be both life-threatening and life-altering. It is heartbreaking to have to tell a mother that her child has died needlessly from a fall. These injuries are entirely preventable with simple window guards and stops. Window guards are affordable, available, and easy to install as a landlord. Pediatric window falls have been rising in the past year. We've seen the numbers we're treating at Children's National double. Many of these falls were from building heights of two to four stories. We also had tragically two fatalities in 2020, as one of the council members mentioned. This recent number of deaths from window falls is unheard of for our area. And again, these deaths are preventables. Are preventable. I commend the council for acting now to intervene. Children fall out of windows due to a combination of factors. One, they are naturally curious and will investigate and play with anything they can. Families underestimate a child's ability to access windows through climbing on or moving nearby furniture. Two, parents place too much faith in window screens, thinking they will keep their child safe from falls. Window screens keep bugs out, not children in. And three, most families generally don't think of windows as a threat to their children. For these reasons, Children National and Safe Kids DC strongly support the legislation proposed by the council. As our council member mentioned, a similar law uh, that mandated landlords in an urban setting supply window guards with for any family with child under the age of 10 was able to reduce window falls by 96% and saved many lives. We also support the inclusion of any window above the ground floor, as we know that children fall out of second and third story windows frequently. This legislation can prevent unnecessary injuries and death in children from window falls. We want to thank the council for its dedication to the safety and well-being of children in Montgomery County. We have full faith this legislation will pass and will allow for a brighter and safer future for the children of Montgomery County. Thank you very much. The next speaker on this public hearing will be Nicola Whiteman. Ms. Whiteman, you may begin your testimony. Oops, sorry, hold on one second. I'm not sure what's happening with the... Oh, here we go, oh, my apologies. Uh, good afternoon, uh, my name is Nicola Whiteman. I am testifying on behalf of AOBA. I do wanna take the time to uh, actually thank Council Members Glass and Katz. I did not present testimony today on Bill 4920, uh, but we did have the opportunity to work with the Council Members on that important bill. Uh, moving to Bill 5120, um, AOBA supports the, the spirit of the bill and shares the county's commitment to ensuring the safety of our residents. Uh, and I will try to uh, highlight some of the issues that we've identified uh, with uh, for amendments. Um, and I will be submitting my longer statement for the record. Uh, first, the obligation to install uh, consistent with the stated intent to protect vulnerable children. Uh, the council should amend the bill to clarify that the obligation to install is triggered by a tenant's written request. Uh, this balances the safety concerns uh, for the bill against the costs associated for some members with compliance. Uh, tenant responsibility and notification. Uh, we do clarify in our amendments um, the obligation for tenants to notify housing providers when they have a child of eligible age. Uh, this, or the form issued by DHCA rather, should also at a minimum inform tenants of their rights and responsibility. Uh, next, annual notification and lease renewals. Uh, we do recommend against consideration of the annual notification requirement as suggested in the hearing packet. Uh, Montgomery County, for example, well, the bill specifically already requires disclosure of that language in the lease. Um, and because of current law, uh, tenants would also get that information under with the renewal. Uh, so there's already a built-in mechanism for making sure that tenants get the information of, regarding their rights when they sign the lease and then again at renewal. Um, we also recommend that DHCA uh, include the language in the landlord tenant handbook, uh, which we are required to provide to tenants. Uh, next, with regards to cost to install, we recommend that the council do consider uh, allowing housing providers the option of passing through this cost, which in some case can be substantial. Uh, we also do echo the comments of other um, to witnesses today for the county to develop a pilot program or a grant program to support the costs associated with installation, particularly for small housing providers, and particularly if the county moves forward uh, with uh, adopting this bill during COVID as those housing providers are, are much more significantly impacted by uh, COVID, the economic impact of COVID-19. Um, just. Ms. Whiteman, my apologies for interrupting. Your time is up. Thank you very much for your time. Thank testimony. you. The, uh, the rest of my comments are included in my testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Deborah Girasek. Dr. Girasek, you may begin your testimony. 
Thank you for this opportunity. More than 20 years ago, I earned a PhD from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. I have been conducting injury prevention research since that time. Now you know a little bit about me. I know nothing about most of you, but I suspect that if you saw a toddler falling from a high rise building, you would run to save its life. It is no exaggeration that you will have the chance to do just that when you vote on Bill 5120. New York City passed its first window guard legislation in 1976. With strengthening and strict enforcement, their policies have reduced children's fatal falls from windows by 92%. Such compelling evidence has caused the American Academy of Pediatrics to support window guard mandates. And it's important to remember that more than 4,000 children a year are treated for non-fatal window falls in the United States. Most of these victims are less than five years of age and 10% of them are left with permanent neurological damage, which is not surprising because children who fall out of windows tend to impact concrete. This is not an easy time for landlords in Montgomery County. I hope that the DHCA makes it easy for them to comply with this law. For example, they could refer landlords to products that meet the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission standards for window guards. They might negotiate bulk pricing and provide sample language for use in leases and tenant notifications. If the county makes it easier to comply with the safety regulation, more landlords will comply. Please do not delay your action on this measure. Toddler deaths from window falls are most common in the spring and summer. This bill may be your best chance to leave a legacy that endures far beyond your term as a member of the County Council. Thank you very much. Mr. President, that wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Um, thank you, Ms. Kennedy. And let me extend my thanks to all the testimony uh, on, on this bill and many of the witnesses that testified on previous bills, um, but mentioned this bill as well. Obviously, um, that was very powerful testimony and we know it's gonna uh, save some lives. So I really appreciate the, uh, the interest in the bill. Let me move on to agenda item 10. This is a public hearing on amendments to the FY21 to 26 Capital Improvements Program parking Bethesda facility renovations, facility plan parking, Bethesda parking lot district, parking Wheaton facility renovations, and facility planning parking Wheaton parking lot district. A joint t &E and Fed committee work session will be scheduled at a later date. Persons wishing to set, submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so no later than the close of business on January 19th. Ms. Kennedy, do we have speakers for this public hearing? We do not. Terrific, okay, and item, 11 is a public hearing on proposed amendments to the 10-year comprehensive water supply and sewerage systems plan, six-year category change requests. A T&E committee work session is tentatively scheduled for Monday, February 1st, 2021. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on January 25th. Ms. Kennedy, please call the speakers for this public hearing. The first speaker for this public hearing will be Catherine Nelson. Ms. Nelson, you may begin your testimony. It is two minutes long. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. For the record, I'm Katherine Nelson, speaking on behalf of the Montgomery County Planning Board and providing their recommendations for this group of six category changes. They were considered on January 7th before the Board. The Planning Board recommends deferral of the Michael Smith application as the concept provided with the application doesn't meet the Cloverly Master Plan recommendations for this zone and for this property in particular things such as protecting a several thousand year old soapstone quarry, preservation of stream valleys in the Patuxent River watershed, clustering of development to provide open space, uh, not to mention the requirements in the 10 year water and sewer plan. Deferring action um, on this request will allow the applicant to work with planning staff and bring the subdivision plan into conformance uh, with the master plan. The planning board recommends approval of the Ashwani Aurora application, but restricted to a single sewer hookup from the existing abutting main only. Uh, they recommend denial of the Kapoor application request for sewer services. It does not meet any of the six conditions outlined for the for sewer service in this area of Potomac and is not consistent with the Piney Branch restricted sewer access policy. In the one recommendation that differs slightly from the executive recommendation, the planning board recommends deferring action on the inane ap application. 
the recommendation allows time for the applicant to develop a concept plan that addresses the significant development challenges of creating a buildable lot from this out lot A. Finally, the planning board recommends denial of both the Pochcini property and the Buona Verma application. These properties do not meet any of the six conditions outlined in the water and sewer plan for service in this part of Glen Hills. And there's no justification in the existing policy for this category change request. The planning board's more detailed recommendations will be forwarded to the council prior to the scheduled T&E meeting, T&E committee meeting. Thank you for the opportunity to review these category changes and provide the planning board's comments. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Siham Anain. Mr. Anain, you may begin your testimony. Please unmute yourself, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. The outlet A for which we are requesting a sewer connection and lot one were one lot. The previous owner subdivided the property and applied for a sewer connection for lot one. However, the subdivision map states out lot A may be converted to a lot through a minor subdivision process at a later date pending septic approval or sewer connection availability. Mr. Sukup suggested that we add a small strip of land to the driveway of outlot A to satisfy the minor subdivision requirement. This would hardly change the size of the outlot, yet it would come at prohibitive cost to us, which we can't afford. In addition, the sewer connection is available on Piney Meeting House Road. We are willing to cover all the costs for extending the connection to the outlot Montgomery County will also collect substantially higher taxes on the lot than what it is collecting right now. I am aware that there is a concern that the approval of this request might set a precedent. However, I spent days studying Montgomery County GIS maps and could not find a single similar situation to ours. Mr. Sukup seemed to agree that this situation is unique. Mr. Sukup wrote the following in his report. Executive staff cannot find a policy justification for this category change request for sewer category S1 and therefore recommend denial, maintaining category S6 for the property. In my humble opinion, the justification is the fact that outlet A situation is unique and shouldn't fall under the current abadian main policy, mains policy. Therefore, I hope you could consider you would consider the uniqueness of this situation and grant us the request. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Lexi Mondat. Ms. Mondat, you may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Hi, thank you everyone for having me. Um, uh, my name is Lexi Mondo and my pronouns are she and hers. Um, I'm just a concerned and interested citizen, and I do apologize in advance because I think I slightly misunderstood um, the water um, hearing, and so I would like to um, at least use this opportunity to, if it's possible, to um, voice my support for previous um, bills that were stated and state that I do fully support the supplemental appropriation to increase the um, budget, the original budget to 10 million for Affordable Housing Act and am in full support of everything that Mary Culler stated earlier and that I do fully support uh, Bill 4920 um, as we see um, today in today's world, um, the disproportionate um, treatment between um, white and um, black citizens in this country and, and fully speak out against the way that homelessness is criminalized in the country and to really have that um, considered and, 
and believe that everyone um, really des deserves shelter. And so it's, it's just um, amazing to me that um, a criminal record is still considered in housing um, and really would like that to bring an end to that. Um, as for the water, um, again, I apologize in advance. Um, my um, concern with water was more about water springs and I realized that that is off topic. So thank you for taking just a second to hear me and I'm happy that I was able to see the other topics that are being discussed today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Kenneth Bauer. Mr. Bauer, you may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Good afternoon, President Hucker and members of the County Council. My name is Kenneth Bauer. I am president of and I'm testifying on behalf of the West Montgomery County Citizens Association. We provided more detailed comments in our written document, which we submitted last week. We strongly support the county executive's recommendations on all of the category requests two through six. The county staff has done a thorough job of analyzing the proposals and the applicable requirements. Just a few detailed comments regarding request number two, uh, 10400 Boswell Lane. We agree that this property qualifies for approval for category S1 based on the Piney Branch abutting Main's policy. However, the approval must be restricted to the 210 foot connection and hookup to the existing sewer line. It actually abuts to, at the northwest corner of the property and not serve as a basis for construction of a completely new sewer line extension, which would result in a new abutting main for 10401 Boswell Lane across the street. To do so would turn a very limited abutting mains policy on its head. And regarding 10401 Boswell Lane, which is across the street, we agree that the request should be denied as it fails to meet any of the requirements for sewer under the Piney Branch restricted access policy. This includes, as discussed above, the abutting mains policy that cannot be used to construct a new sewer line to this property. The applicant cites the approval for RAM investing from 2002 in support of its application. Recalling the history of the RAM investing property confirms that approval should not be granted here. The RAM approval clearly violated the provisions of the Potomac Master Plan and the Piney Branch Sewer Restricted Access Policy dealing with sewer extensions. The RAM investing approval certainly cannot be used as a basis for any approvals in the Piney Branch Special Protection Area. It contained the following statement, quote, this approval represents an exception to the Piney Branch Sewer Restricted Access Policy and is not a precedent for, for possible future exception requests. We strongly support the County Executive's recommendations for requests four, five, and six, and please refer to our written testimony for details. That concludes my testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next speaker for this public hearing is Anand Verma. You may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. You may begin. Good, Good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Anand Verma. I'm a 72 year old county resident for the last 35 years. I have owned this lot uh, on Glen Mill Road for the last 17 years. And I have some disability now. I wanted to build a, a Rambler one story home so I, I could ambulate and of course, it could facilitate my movement on the same level. Our unimproved lot demonstrated through conventional trench system testing in 1959 and 2010 and sand mound testing in uh, 2012. No suitability for an on-site septic system. Please note the following points. The recorded lot is the only vacant undeveloped property out of 54 built homes on both sides of the street between 13500 Glen Mill Road and 14300 Glen Mill Road, and as such, it is uniquely situated. Uh, the second point is that lot at 0.92 acre, which is RE1 zoned, has no potential for resubdivision under the existing RE1 zoning. Third point is constructing a sewer main has only minimal environmental impact on the neighborhood and does not affect stream or stream buffers. In Appendix C of Exceptional Service Policy Recommendations 2018-2027, County Council approved in October 2018, uh, pertinently stated, 
the master plan recommends that RE1 and RE2 zone properties located at the edge of periphery of the rec recommended community service envelope may be considered for community service uh, sewer service on a case-by-case -case basis. In such cases, among other things, council uh, noted the extension of community uh, sewer service is extended to follow existing public right-of-way and must not uh, affect the streams, the stream valley buffers, and other environmentally sensitive areas. Mr. Verma, Mr. Verma, my apologies for interrupting, but your time is up. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Our next, our next speaker for this public hearing is Ravinder Kapoor. You may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Hi, thank you, uh, Council, for uh, your time today. I strongly disagree with the previous speakers. Um, I am a lifetime resident of Montgomery County. I raised my family here. I plan to retire here. Uh, we are requesting to hook up our existing home to a sewer main on our street so that we may use our land to fit the, our needs of our family and provide safety to our guests when they visit. My father-in-law suffered a debilitating stroke that requires him constant attention, which has put a great deal of burden on our mom. They, put, they helped us growing up and it's our turn to help them. We would like to properly expand our home at 10401 Boswell so that we, um, so that we can help them. Uh, however, we have a septic field that is a limiting factor. In addition, we have an issue with safety of parking because of the septic field and Boswell Lane is very busy. Ours is a very unique case. We are the last property that qualifies for public sewer on Boswell Lane and the last property that can be served by this main and after our property, there's slopes down and, and that slope and topography, uh, th th those properties will be served by a different name. So this, this request follows the intent of the master plan, which is to prevent sprawl. There is no sprawl that can happen here. We are the last property. So it makes, it, it follows the intent of the master plan. We applied in 2012 and for sewer category change and we were rejected. Meanwhile, a billionaire received it. We applied, <clears throat> Um, so we turned to DEP for guidance, who told us to ask, talk to our neighbors. We asked our neighbors, two other people were interested. However, um, <clears throat> um, um, they are now being, uh, 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 one was administratively approved and the other was not. Meanwhile, builders on our street, Graham Investing, Potomac Preserve, they keep getting approvals. I am trying to get approval for the safety reasons and for my family. I pay taxes on my property. My request follows the intent of the master plan. Um, <clears throat> since, um, since I'm only asking for one hookup, I think that it, the, I plead to the council to please, you know, approve my request. I don't have the funds to hire an attorney like some of these builders do with the billions that got approval. I, so I, for our county officials for guidance. Uh, we turned to DEP's Alan Sukup, who told us to ask, talk to our neighbor to extend the, to extend it. And so we did. Alan, it wasn't specifically Alan Sukup, but George, George uh, Dezales, who told us to talk to our neighbor to extend his sewer main, which we, we then asked our neighbor. They, they agreed in an email, which is what DEP requested. When we sent it, then we were, uh, um, we basically followed their guidance. Mr. Kukor, Mr. Kukor, my apologies for interrupting, but I'm sorry, your time is up on this public hearing. We want to thank you for your testimony. Mr. President, that wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Thank you so much, Ms. Kennedy. Uh, now we'll move to a briefing by the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission on the streets and parks renaming effort. Ms. Dunn, do you want to? Oh. The chair of the Fed committee would like to say a few words. Well, I thought I would. <clears throat> Please. Kick us off. Okay. Kick us off. Thank you. And then I'll pass it to council staff and we'll go, I'm sure, to the planning board. So we had a very um, uh, powerful conversation at the Fed committee about renaming streets in Montgomery County and parks and other federal uh, facilities. And um, this follows a letter that the council sent to the planning board. I think it was last spring. Um, and uh, I think council member Freitzen may have taken the lead to put that letter together. And I believe the whole council, I, I know the whole council joined. 
Um, we, the project that ensued uh, became very large. And um, I think that was a fair interpretation of the letter that went over. Um, but, and as a result, the, the planning staff and the historic preservation staff uh, began to research you know, hundreds or even thousands of street names and they built a novel database of uh, people, names in the county and Confederate soldiers and they began to match. Um, and they came back to us seeking additional guidance about how to proceed. Um, so the Fed Committee met to kind of think all of this through. We had a, a really great discussion. Again, we were joined. Uh, Councilmember Jawando suggested that we bring in the uh, Commission on Remembrance and Reconciliation, uh, which Councilmember Jawando, Councilmember Rice, and I uh, formed several years ago, two years ago. We had a, it was really a terrific idea. I thought that was a very powerful conversation. Ms. Professor O'Keener. Uh, Christian Dark joined us, and uh, Susan Jenkins joined us, and um, you know we talked about the importance of taking these actions, and uh, it, it was it was informative. Um, you know, just to say for a moment on the substance of it, one of the most jarring images from uh, this past week, I'm sure for for everyone, was the display of the Confederate flag inside the United States Capitol, uh, something that was never achieved by the Confederate Army and uh, was yet brought to us by a mob of angry, um, you know, angry people trying to invalidate the results of an election and uh, essentially turn the tide against democracy and electing the government. And, um, it, you know, here we are today talking about something that's very quite similar. The streets that are named in Montgomery County for Jeb Stewart and, uh, and Early um, are, are trying to send the same message. <clears throat> Montgomery County was developed, some of it was developed, you know, hundreds of years ago. Some of these names date back hundreds of years. Some of them are more modern. And the ones that we are really, we need to focus on right now and resolve are the ones that are, were established in order to send a message, frankly, of white supremacy. And after the Fair Housing Act made it illegal to put covenants into property and say that black people can't live in these neighborhoods and Jewish people can't leave in those neighborhoods. Uh, you know, the real estate community came up with some workarounds. And um, one of those was to proudly display names and iconography of, of the Confederacy. And so Montgomery County has roads named for generals and, you know, prominent Confederate military officers who led the attack on our Capitol. Um, and in fact, you know, marched down Georgia Avenue and attacked, uh, attacked Fort Stevens and shot at the president, um, President Lincoln there. So it is a shame, it is our shame that when you drive on Montrose Road, you see a sign uh, that points you to early court. And the community there has been demanding that we fix that. Councilmember Friedson and I joined a rally. Uh, Montrose Square is the name of the community. And we walked with many, many residents there uh, months and months ago as they demanded that we take action to to change this, uh, you know, to change these street names. And um, so <clears throat> the Fed Committee met to talk through how to proceed. And the, I think that the packet lays it all out. It's very clear. But I, so I'd like to just summarize and then we'll, you know, we'll get the presentation and go to discussion. But there are, I think, three remaining um, really egregious examples of streets. There's Jeb, Jedediah, there's Early Court, um, and there is, um, sorry, I'm trying to pull up the packet here, Jeb Stewart Court, Jeb Stewart Road, and Jubal Early Court. The 
the Jeb Stewart Trail has already been renamed. Um, and we need to we need to proceed immediately to rename these. And so I think, it, you know, it ought to be the sense of the council at the end of this discussion that we would ask the planning board to initiate renaming to gather community input about alternative names and to conclude that process with new names uh, for those three roads in, in, within three months. You know, I, I think it's gone on far too long and it should end. And then as for the remaining hundreds of names that we don't yet know, we haven't yet figured out why a, a park was named or a road was named, we, we will have a research process that continues. We'll have governmental departments working together and we can assess in the budget if we need additional resources, you know, to continue with this strategy um, and what, what additional names we want to change. Um, you know, the point has been made that some of these names are really hard to identify what the real history of that is. You know, if a community is named for a, a landowner who was a, it was a, a, a slave owning farm and the, the, the slave owning landowner has the name, but there's also a, there was a enslaved or a free community that had the same name, what is it named for? Um, so there's some nuances that just require a little bit more research. So we'll, we'll continue working on this, but we, we should get immediate satisfaction on these three remaining names uh, and, and then continue through that. So um, that's the gist of the, you know, the discussion and the packet that you have. I'll, I know we're joined today by Tanya Stern and Gwen Wright and Pam Dunn and Angela Brown, who I think it was our first time having Ms. Brown at our committee and she handles, she handles all of these complicated questions about how homeowners interact with their street names, I guess, essentially she's in the legal department, I think. Um, and it was, it was actually, it was very enlightening to hear what is involved in changing the name uh, of a street. So um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it to Pam and um, we'll proceed through. Thank you. Uh, well, I think, uh, hold on, council member Juwando, are, are we gonna do council comments before the staff? No, no, I, I, I wanted to speak, ask a question after the presentation. Right, okay, well, let's, should we all hear the presentation? Is that fine? And then we'll all have things to say, I imagine. Okay, great. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to, it's Montgomery Square, just uh, Regency Estates in Montgomery Square, just since I'm sure they're watching, uh, uh, Council Member Reamer had the slight uh, wrong names. I just wanted to make sure since uh, they should- Let's get, get the names right, for, today of all day. I'll, I'll reserve the rest of my comments for when I speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Way to clean it up. Okay, uh, Ms. Dunn. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Councilmember Reamer. He did a great job of summarizing what had occurred at the um, Fed Committee, who did receive a very lengthy briefing on this. I think we met for two hours. Um, we do have a staff report. It summarizes that briefing. It gives, hopefully, um, numerous highlights of the work that's been done by the Parks Department and the Planning Department. They've done um, an amazing amount of research into the topic, and they have created a historical database and just historical knowledge about Montgomery County, the Confederacy, people who lived here, um, and people who were enslaved. They've uncovered a lot of names related to that. I'm not going to take the time because you're going to hear it from them, and they're the ones who created the work. Um, we then have time for questions, uh, and I'm here if you just need anything uh, related to follow-up um, or administrative, but I'm going to turn it over to planning and parks. I'm sorry. Councilmember Navarro, did you want to get in? I can't wait for after the report. Thank you. So uh, if we're ready to uh, begin with our presentation, um, sorry, I just had to jump on late. I was having a little trouble with the link. Um, we have uh, been working hard to try to be responsive to the council's request to uh, conduct the necessary research to understand where there are names of uh, streets, parks, and other uh, public facilities that are uh, named after uh, people who fought on the side of the Confederacy uh, or were otherwise involved uh, with uh, the slave trade in uh, Montgomery County uh, and issues that are uh, related to that request. 
uh, you're going to hear a, a staff presentation uh, from both the parks and the planning department about the research and what action we've taken to date. Uh, the planning board will be considering a resolution on Thursday to immediately begin the process of renaming the uh, three streets that we've identified that are named after uh, Jeb Stewart. And uh, those represent, I think, uh, the, the first work product that is really ready for us to begin uh, the process of, of going through uh, renaming. As you're going to hear, there is a lot of complexity and nuance to the research that has gone into uh, this effort. So by way of example, uh, there are some cases in which uh, a common surname uh, is given to a street that may be in proximity to uh, land that was owned by a family that may have uh, had people who uh, were involved in the Confederacy or otherwise involved in, in um, owning uh, enslaved people. Um, however, on further examination, it turns out that not only is that street name in common with uh, other families in the same general part of the county, but in fact, the street was named after a prominent African-American family. So sometimes uh, even the street names or place names that appear to be clear-cut um, instances uh, of uh, extremely troubling uh, designations given to public places on further examination uh, turn out to be not the case. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit about some of the of the other uh, complexities involved in this research, uh, but I wanted to provide that uh, context to you as you think about how you want to give us direction to proceed. Uh, uh, last thing I'll say is, um, in addition to renaming these three streets, we're continuing with the research process. Uh, we're not we were not waiting for further council direction, but we wanted to bring you up to date and make sure you understood what we were doing and how we were going about doing it. So we'd give you a chance to, to weigh in, but that has not been at the expense of uh, delaying this process. Uh, we are trying to move forward as quickly as, as possible and expeditiously as possible, consistent with doing uh, this, the kind of careful research and historical uh, work that's necessary to understand where there are uh, streets or parks or uh, other public uh, places and infrastructure that are that uh, really should be considered for renaming. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mita Figueredo, the Deputy Director of the Parks Department, to talk about uh, the Parks Department work on this project. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Um, I'm Mitty Figueredo, Deputy Director for Administration at the Montgomery Parks Department. I'm going to start off this presentation and then I will hand it off to my counterpart at the Planning Department, Tanya Stern. So if we could go to the next slide. So as you can see, this is the council request that um, uh, Chair Anderson and the planning board received from the council in June, which kicked off the efforts that we're gonna be describing you to, do, to you today to review all county street and park facility names to determine which were named for Confederates or others not reflecting Montgomery County values. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see, the council letter from June was addressed to the county executive as well as the planning board chair um, with the expectation that other county agencies would also be participating in this effort. MCPS has in fact initiated its renaming efforts beginning with renaming Ebrook Lee Middle School to Odessa Shannon Middle School. Uh, Parks and Planning continue to coordinate with MCPS sharing research um, as we proceed with this uh, renaming work. Um, and as we understand it, updates on the renaming effort by other county agencies are still pending. Next slide, please. Um, so as soon as we received the council request, we launched a dedicated website and email address to inform the community of our work um, and to collect information from residents and stakeholders. The community has been encouraged to weigh in by submitting comments on our website or via de the dedicated project email, renaming at montgomeryplanning.org. Um, the project website includes a robust frequently asked questions page with information about our research methodology and information about Montgomery Planning's existing street renaming policy. Additionally, Planning Director Gwen Wright has sent letters to all municipalities within Montgomery County informing them of the effort and inviting them to participate in our efforts. Several have contacted Parking Planning staff 
to collaborate. Staff has also been working, again, as I said earlier, with MCPS and other county agencies to inform them of the project, coordinate, and share research. Uh, next slide, please. So this effort is very timely. Many local governments around the country have been asked to study this same issue. We have taken a deliberate phased approach in order to reach solidly researched conclusions for each category of names that we will present to the board, to the council and to the public. In order to initiate the project, we relied on primary source material to compile a database of names against which we could match our streets and facilities. This work's been extremely rewarding for our historians, and once it's complete and it's been thoroughly checked, we look forward to sharing it with the public and other researchers here and around the country. In doing this, we identified 709 known Confederates. These include 440 senior officers of the Confederacy and 269 local Montgomery County Confederates, 5,826 slaveholders, and 3,300 named enslaved individuals. We found 325 streets that had a preliminary match with Confederate surnames and two parks that had a confirmed match with Confederate surnames. Uh, I wanna note that the research is still ongoing to confirm some of these surname associations. And then these are the four categories of names that we came up with to frame our research of those who are Confederates or others who do not reflect Montgomery County values we believe that they're the most responsive to the council's request and would appropriately prioritize the most urgently required changes. Our phase one findings, which will be detailed further in this presentation, focus on a subset of the streets and park assets that have full name matches with nationally known Confederates. And again, these categories are nationally known Confederates, local Confederates, Confederate sympathizers, and slaveholders. And with this, I will now hand off this presentation to Deputy Planning Director Tanya Stern, but I will remain available for any questions related to any park assets and related issues. Thank you, Mitty. Next slide, please. Again, I'm Tanya Stern, Deputy Director at the Planning Department. Uh, we wanted to give you an overview of the uh, Commission's uh, naming policies uh, and procedures for both streets and parks. MNCPPC under uh, Maryland state law is the sole entity authorized with naming or renaming streets in a county uh, with the exception of certain uh, municipalities. Um, and the planning board has the sole of approval authority over street renaming. In terms of the process, um, either a property owner or a developer can request a street name or the planning board can initiate the street naming or renaming. We do have um, uh, procedures in place um, to guide the street naming process. We have an addressing a street naming manual as well as the street renaming policy, both of which are available on the planning department's website. And in terms of the naming of park assets, there is um, an existing uh, planning board adopted park naming policy that strongly encourages naming park assets after geographical or ecological features, neighborhoods or nearby public facilities. Uh, and it also grants uh, the planning board the sole authority co to commemoratively name park assets after individuals. Next slide. So um, this slide shows uh, the results of the phase one research, uh, which uh, Mitty uh, described earlier. These uh, three streets, Jeb Stewart Court, Jeb Stewart Road, and Jubal Early Court are the streets three streets with full name matches to nationally known Confederates. Um, and also there is Jeb Stewart Trail, uh, which has been mentioned earlier, has already been uh, renamed. Next slide. So this is a, a summary of the uh, Fed Committee briefing that took place uh, last month. Um, just some highlights from uh, Pam's uh, staff report for that Fed briefing, um, noting uh, uh, recommending concurrence with our uh, research methodology and findings. Uh, the council staff report also cited the potential to build upon this research to promote a broader understanding of the county's historical narrative, as well as commemorate, com commemorate the history of enslaved residents and African-Americans in a county. The council staff report also supported focusing on place names for the next phase of this effort uh, to include the evaluation of all parks 
facilities and buildings whose names are matched with the surname of any uh, Confederate uh, nationally known or local or any Montgomery County identified slaveholder. And also noted that placing matches also should um, generate uh, greater participation from other county agencies uh, who uh, oversee facilities in the county. And uh, just wanted to note that the commission concurs with the council staff recommendation. Next slide. Here we summarize the direction that we heard from the Fed Committee, uh, as uh, Council Member Reamer noted earlier, uh, to proceed with the renaming of the three streets identified in phase one. Uh, we've also have uh, been doing some follow-up with the city of Tacoma Park regarding uh, certain streets that were discussed during the uh, Fed briefing um, that have um, uh, streets that, are, that have last name matches to nationally known Confederates. Um, also, the direction is to focus on facility place names uh, per the council staff's recommendation. And uh, these three bullets um, kind of highlight the direction that we heard in terms of uh, which, type, which place names to focus on, um, to look for named associations that have nothing to do with the geographic location, um, that are not named for property owners or farms, and also uh, to look for named associations that represent a deliberate choice to send a message as to who is welcome and who is not welcome in certain communities. And um, there's also a discussion about uh, investigating the financial implications of the street renamings on the affected property owners on those three streets in phase one, and to work with the county to identify any options to support those uh, property owners in dealing with the financial costs uh, to rename um, related to the renaming. Next slide. So um, in terms of next steps, as um, our Planning Board Chair Anderson noted this Thursday, uh, we will be introducing a resolution to the Planning Board to initiate the process of renaming Jubal Early Court, Jeb Stewart Road, and Jeb Stewart Court. We will also continue with the place name research and uh, also follow up uh, over the coming months uh, in terms of the impl implementation with the Fed Committee, the Planning Board, and the full council. So that concludes our presentation and we are happy to uh, help answer your questions. Thank you so much, very informative. Um, okay, I think uh, the chairman wanted to get in and then we'll go to everybody else on the, on the council. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we, we did have some discussion about the financial implications and Ms. Brown observed that it's not uncommon for a street to have to change its addresses. Um, you know, if a, if a new house, if, if a lot is subdivided and a new house is built, that has an impact on the remaining street. So um, it's debatable really whether the county has any kind of, you know, obligation in this instance that's different than the a normal instance of residents of a street having to change their address information. And um, so we did talk about that uh, quite a bit. And, um, you know, I think it's unresolved at the moment. And, um, you know, personally, I don't think it's really necessary. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> I, with that, I'll, I'll kick it back. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Joanna. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to again to the Planning Board and Parks uh, and the whole team. Uh, this is such an important topic, uh, so much so that even after the two-hour briefing, I asked for another briefing for you know just just for my lonesome for with the group, and I really appreciate it. Um, absolutely, let's move forward with the for with as we are with the names uh, that are connected to those uh, nationally known Confederates. Uh, I think. Just for the benefit of my colleagues, one of the things that I suggested, in addition to suggesting that the commission, um, the Re Re Reconciliation and Remembrance Commission be uh, uniquely tied to this, not only so they can hear what's going on, but that they can give advice. Because as you know, around the country, this is a ongoing discussion about what is the proper way and, and how much uh, research uh, resources do we need to dedicate to this? How long of a period? What are the prioritizations? And, and I just think this is going to be something 
if you looked at that list that was presented, um, you know, nationally known Confederates, uh, local Confederates, slaveholders, um, and then I, I forget what the fourth was. I, I think this is going to be something that should be something that's being researched over time and we get periodic reports back on as we get more information because you could go really deeply into this uh, and we should and I think there's important historical significance, uh, some of which is related to street naming, others which is just related to for land use and, and what we're currently doing now in, in the county and where people lived and how they accrued their wealth and educational benefits. So there's a lot of there's a lot here uh, that I think we're, uh, this is certainly the right first step to take immediately. And, and you, as you heard, it's not an, even though it seems easy, there's a lot of steps in the process. Um, but I would recommend as we move through this, that we uh, allow the planning department and everyone involved in the other in the other agencies to do this work, but with planning and parks as the lead to continue to research this and then report back, set up some mechanism, either through the Remembrance Commission or coming back to council at a defined period of time or the Fed committee so that we can check in and make recommendations because this is gonna be an ongoing uh, process. And I just wanted to offer that as a suggestion as I've thought about it more, as I've dug into it more. Uh, we do need to know the answers to these questions, but I think we need to, uh, one of the ways we can handle it is maybe by sequencing it and, and having some dedicated research over time that will require some budget, uh, but balancing the obviously the fiscal situation we're in. So, so I just wanted to offer that and uh, appreciate all the work that has been done uh, to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you uh, to everyone involved in this. I um, have to, of course, point out that you know, this really is under a framing uh, that this county, uh, specifically this council began in earnest in 2019 with our racial equity and social justice legislation. Uh, and no doubt that I think what uh, Councilmember Joanna just pointed to, I, I think it's important because it is true that for example, um, with the Odessa Shannon Middle School, which is, which is something that I, work with the community to begin and to initiate and let to the Board of Education doing a more comprehensive review. Um, I think that we need to move expeditiously while we're also doing the structural work. And so to the extent that we can apply that approach here, that would be wonderful. Um, I am really, uh, you know, inspired and heartened by the fact that here in the county, we have really truly moved in a structural fashion to address all of these different issues. All of them are interconnected. Uh, we just continue to witness how many of these issues are driving so much of what's happening uh, nationally. And, and it's really truly- be you know, Ultimately, these were neighbors who didn't like the fact that when they went on their walk uh, were uh, humiliated uh, and embarrassed and ashamed, uh, and that is people of all stripes, backgrounds, creeds, and colors, uh, to have these symbols uh, and glorifications of slavery and of racism and of the Confederacy, of traitors to our country and even more so traitors to humanity. And, uh, you know, so the Montgomery Square, Square community, the Regency Estates community, I mean, that really is what this is all about. That's what local government should be about. This is really a good example of us uh, stepping up. Some of this is really complicated. And, and as we heard earlier today, and we need to take the time to think through it and to research it and to make sure that we have a stakeholder and community input with it. And some of it is re very clear. And uh, I'm appreciative of the fact that we can separate those two uh, things out and we can uh, work through this and make sure that we're taking the immediate action that is necessary, which prompted uh, this letter and that the community is uh, insisting upon and demanding of us uh, while also taking the type of thoughtful, deliberative, researched approach with stakeholders uh, to make sure that we get uh, the rest right and reflect uh, our values, but a process that is respectful uh, of the history uh, of this as well, because some of the history is more complicated of uh, what names uh, are reflecting 
uh, which people, and it's not uh, as straightforward as, uh, as these particular streets that have uh, been mentioned before. I also wanted to note, you know, as we talk about, and we have been doing a lot of work prior to recent events this year and in 2020, uh, and certainly during this year of dismantling structural racism and institutional racism, the structures matter, but the symbols matter too. And obviously the structures are what is most important, where is most deep seated. And that work is very difficult and we are continuing to work on that. We have to do better. We will pledge to do better together, but the symbols matter. And uh, that is uh, not just what perpetuates uh, institutional racism, but what normalizes it and legitimizes it by making it just almost a regular thing. And uh, if ever there was a reminder of that it was this week when we had people with Confederate flags running into the United States Capitol. That symbol mattered. It mattered uh, to all of us as Americans. The fact that uh, you had people with, uh, with swastikas and six million wasn't enough, uh, a reference to six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust not being uh, enough. Those were symbols, people wearing and carrying symbols uh, that were being brought into a structure and a symbol uh, of uh, our democracy and our country of, of who we are. And so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I think sometimes we try to say, well, this is important and that isn't important or which is more important. And the answer is yes, and they're both important and we have to do both. And I'm proud of this work, proud of the fact that uh, we have uh, been moving on that. And I hope we can move with due haste uh, on this first step and then continue uh, the process on future steps and agree with uh, Councilmember Reamer and, and, and Jawando on the Fed Committee and uh, Councilmember Rice and Navarro and everybody else, uh, that this is gonna be an ongoing process for the rest of this. And that was always part of the expectation uh, that all of us had, that I had when I drafted this, that everybody had when we spoke about it and everybody weighed in and made their edits and uh, had, had their thoughts that this was going to be uh, something where we need to take immediate action on the things that were obvious and that we needed to take ongoing action because uh, dismantling institutionalized racism is a process that doesn't end and that has to continue. And this is reflective of that as well. So thank you to everybody and appreciate the uh, work here as always. Thank you, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Council President. Um, let me say very clearly, I am most supportive. Um, as some have, have mentioned before, I'm a student of history, I, I, especially in Montgomery County history. And some of the history that we have, we're not always proud of it. But that doesn't mean we don't have that as a history. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't change our history. Um, everybody should have a sense of pride in their home. And, and uh, obviously your address matters. Um, but this also allows us by changing names this also allows us a, um, a sense of healing to say, you know, we are, we do have a history and we're not always proud of it, but that we, we work to change what we are not proud of. So I think that's very necessary as well. But I do want to clearly say, I believe we do need to help with the cost of name changes. Years ago, Gaithersburg had one zip code, I, and I, I was trying to keep my think about it, and I Googled, and I couldn't even figure out what the old zip code was. I think it was 20760, if my memory serves me right. And the post office decided to change it to three different zip codes. Now, obviously, there's, there's others with the Gaithersburg address, but there are three different zip codes. And the amount of work and expense, and the post office did it for the people in Gaithersburg, who did not ask that this be done, was amazing. You had to change your driver's license. I don't know what, in this case, whether people would have to change the deeds on their home, uh, whether or not, I mean, obviously your mailing addresses, when you, when you think about it, uh, um, all of the things that are so necessary to do that we take for granted in some cases, and Government is, is requiring this, and we should require it, but government is requiring it, so we should help with the expense if there's any expense involved in it, and we should help with filling out the forms of doing it because it's the right thing to do all around. Thanks. Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Last comment I just wanted to make. Uh, a couple of years ago, 2018, I think Catherine Leggett and I joined together 
to advocate that we name the high school that was formerly the Charles A. Woodward High School in honor of Josiah Henson. And Josiah Henson lived across the street and he has been called by the historians at Park and Planning as the most consequential resident of Montgomery County in the 19th century. Uh, he was an abolitionist who did a tremendous amount to um, advance the cause of abolition and, and bring us ultimately to the Civil War that ended slavery. I don't think there is a single name, road named in Montgomery County in his honor. Uh, it, you know, it's unfortunately telling that we would have three roads named for minor Confederate generals and not a single one named for one of the most important advocates of abolition in an entire century. And um, I think we need to name the high school that is across the street from where he lived in his honor. And I hope the school board will do that. And uh, I, I I think we need to do, I, I'm thrilled by the, um, by, sorry, my son's joined me. I'm thrilled by the uh, museum that's opening soon. And uh, I look forward to this progress, that this process coming to a conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I think that concludes this briefing. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'll be very brief. I just didn't want to miss the opportunity to express my deep appreciation for the thoughtful and deliberative approach that Park and Planning staff went about this. Clearly, there were a lot of layers and a lot of complexities, and that will, you know, in some cases be ongoing. But you met the moment clearly, uh, and I just want to express my appreciation to all of you. And putting on my old youth development hat, I would always look for teachable moments when I was working with youth, and certainly as a parent. And this is this is one of them. Uh, in real time, you know, we are looking at addressing some of the wrongs of the past in a way that kids can actually literally touch and feel. And so I think as we discuss with our colleagues and MCPS different opportunities to engage students in having these very important and complex discussions about our history. Moments like this matter. And, and I think this can be used as an example moving forward that things can change. Uh, and obviously this is more than just symbolic. Um, it goes deeper than that. So thank you all very much for this incredibly impressive work. And Council Member Katz. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to comment on Council Member Reamers. I certainly am extremely supportive of naming a road for Josiah, Josiah Henson. I think any new schools to be named for Josiah, Josiah Henson. But to change the name of Woodward High School, if you look at uh, uh, Judge Woodward, who that high school is named for, I, I believe that that would not be correct to do that. Uh, the family is a very deep-rooted family in Montgomery County. I think there's three generations of judges and maybe more than that. I don't know. But I, I think that, that we should certainly do have a Henson High School, and no question. But I don't believe we should take that honor away from Judge Woodward. Thanks. Uh, Mr. President. Uh, Councilor Dramato. Just something briefly, I'm not to get not no debate here. I, I meant to say this, but Councilmember Reamer reminded me in his points, and Councilmember Navarro as well, as we did with as the school board did, uh, at you know as a result of the work that they did with Odessa Shannon Middle School. It's equally as important that we take the opportunity not just to be neutral, not just remove the harm of the name, but use it as an opportunity to tell the full history of our county and to honor people who have been not honored and underrepresented. And I just think that that needs to be a theme with the Jubal early streets that, that we need to intentionally, and there's work that needs to go into that. So it's not only the work of identifying what is the wrong names and the wrong people to honor, there's just as much as importance, if not you know equal or more on what we change it to. And I just wanna make sure that just another a layer of complexity, and I'm really happy in the case of Odessa Shannon, but we just have to make sure that that's part of our work as well. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more hands. I think this concludes this briefing. Uh, colleagues, thank you so much to the planning board and staff for all your very hard and dedicated work on this. Uh, let me move on to legislative session day two. We have to introduce some bills. Um, the first is expedited bill 121, growth and infrastructure policy renamed expedited development approval excise tax repealed. 
Lead sponsor is the council, county council. The public hearing is scheduled for February 2nd at 1.30. Mr. Drummer. Any comments on this, Mr. Drummer? Uh, there we go. There, there we go. Uh, well, this is something, this is a bill uh, that it changes the name of the subdivision staging policy to the growth and infrastructure policy, which is something that the council had done in November along with the SSP. And this is following along to uh, go through the code and find the many references to the subdivision staging policy and change it to the growth and infrastructure policy. And while we were doing that, uh, we also noticed that there was an obsolete set, uh, section of the code, the expedited development approval excise tax, which is no longer in use and there's nobody who's paying it and nobody who's paid it recently. And it's a, a method of development that's no longer available. So this bill would also take that out of the code as obsolete. And that's what the bill does. Thank you. So stick around, Bob. The second one is expedited bill 221, taxation development impact taxes for transportation and public school improvements, amendments, effective date. Uh, the lead sponsor is the county council. The public hearing is scheduled for the 19th of January. Bob. Okay, and this bill, if you remember, and I'm sure you do, is, uh, along with the SSP, the impact tax bill, bill 38-20, that was uh, vetoed by the uh, executive. The council overrode the veto in December, but in doing so, it changed the effective date of the bill to March 9th, and uh, the rest of the SSP and the impact tax rates that you had approved were uh, effective on February 26th. So this bill would move the effective date of Bill 3820 back from March 9th to February 26th to be uh, consistent with what you've done in the uh, SSP soon to and now called the Growth and Infrastructure Policy. And that's that bill. Thank you, Mr. Drummer. Very helpful. Okay, Bill 321 is the special taxing area laws Silver Spring Business Improvement District established. Lead sponsors are Councilmember Reamer and Council President Hucker. Uh, Mr. Drummer. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Councilmember Reamer. You want Bob to go first, Hans? Yeah. Um, okay, this bill uh, would implement a state law that authorizes the county to create a business improvement district, which is uh, simply a separate taxing area where the property owners would be taxed and the, the receipts of that tax would be used only for that property that's in the business improvement district. And the point is to increase, have uh, additional services for that area that do not exist throughout the county. And uh, the, the area that that is involved here would be downtown Silver Spring, the Silver Spring, uh, essentially the Silver Spring Urban District. It's not exactly the same, uh, but it's pretty close to the Silver Spring Urban District. There's a group of business uh, owners, uh, property owners, I should say, who have shown interest in applying to uh, uh, for the Business Improvement District and they would create a business improvement district corporation that would operate the business improvement district. And that's what this bill does. Governor, uh, Councilman Reamer. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Council President. Uh, it's been a pleasure teaming up with you to Likewise. think this through. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, the process that will go through in the coming weeks and months as we take this up. Um, now this is coming to us from uh, business owners, property owners in Silver Spring that want to take downtown Silver Spring to the next level. Um, I really compliment the work of the county over the years in the revitalization of Silver Spring. I think it has been a remarkable success, success but we're not done yet. And I think it is fair to say that the downtown probably didn't have the resources 
uh, to manage a bid, you know, five, 10 years ago, but it's there now. You know, we have the, the strong uh, development that has come in that the owners of those buildings are, are ready to work together with the business community and uh, to focus on placemaking and, and management of the district and uh, take it to the next level, make it, make it even better. So um, there's gonna be a lot of complicated details to work through. Uh, this, you know, I wouldn't say this is a super heavy lift, but it is certainly gonna be a lift. And um, we'll have a public hearing and we'll hear from everybody. We've already made a number of changes to this framework um, from what was originally proposed to us. And uh, it, we will continue to make changes as we go. But I think it's exciting that we have uh, such strong interest from uh, the private sector uh, that wants to step up and manage Silver Spring to make it more competitive, more exciting, more 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 th more thrilling, and and ultimately uh, more thriving. So look forward to working with you, and certainly encourage uh, our colleagues to uh, co-sponsor if they are interested. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll just uh, chime in briefly that, well, I'm certainly grateful to, uh, to you, Councilmember Arun, for your leadership on this and your responsiveness to the folks who have recommended this. Um, I'll add that this, um, the bill's responsive to the process that's outlined in the state legislation that was passed by Delegate Moon several years ago. And it's been, it's been several years since that passed. Many of us remember when that was in. And uh, in that time, there have been advocates talking to business owners uh, in Silver Spring about the need for additional services on top of what already happens uh, in Silver Spring. People are very grateful for what's happened to Silver Spring and the county's investment, the state's investment over the last 20 years. Um, but at the same time, it's not uh, really where we want it to be. Uh, it has uh, suffered under, under COVID and before that from a um, challenging retail environment and, and several other uh, challenges. And um, uh, at the same time, not a day goes by when I don't hear from people about um, the unrealized potential that they feel there and the need for a more supportive um, business environment and a more supportive environment for the public in terms of more programming, more safety, more services. Um, and those are all things I think that could be accomplished uh, in a properly designed um, bid with a lot of public participation. So we've received the petitions from the business owners that triggers a um, deadline under the state legislation where we have to hold a public hearing it makes sense to have some legislation um, to uh, enact uh, that, uh, you know, that people can react to in the public hearing. And we're eager to hear from lots of members of the public to make this as uh, strong uh, and responsive legislation as possible. Council Member Friedson. Yes, thank you. Uh, appreciate uh, both uh, you, uh, the chair of the Fed Committee and the district council member and council president, I think appropriately putting this uh, forward. It's a big uh, move. There's a lot of moving parts. There'll be a lot of uh, conversation and discussion, but I think this uh, represents uh, progress, and I'd be uh, happy to be listed as a co-sponsor. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. With that, I think we have our, oh, Council Member Friedson, yes, President. Council Member Katzkine, and then Council Member Navarro. And I, too, would like to be added as a co-sponsor, please. Great. I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor, please. Terrific, thank you. Councilmember Rice. Thank you, I'd like to be added as co-sponsor as well. Okay, thank you. I think we've introduced our three bills, uh, colleagues, and we can move on to the district council session. Um, this is the introduction of the Shady Grove Minor Master Plan. Uh, Ms. Dunn. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, you have, or you will be receiving in your mailboxes, I'm going to deliver them tomorrow, um, hard copies of the Shady Grove sector plan. It's a minor master plan amendment. Um, planning has been working on this for a couple years now. It's, um, it's actually quite a large area. It is mostly centered around the metro station in Shady Grove, but it does include the county service park um, and some surrounding neighborhoods and properties also to the west side of um, 355. Um, and you'll have a public hearing on this. We're announcing that today. It will be on February 23rd, uh, and then it'll be followed by Fed Committee work sessions and then back to council. Uh, what you'll receive hard copies, the introduction for this, the staff report does include a link if anyone's interested or the community is interested. There's a link in that staff report to take you to the planning board's um, draft of the sector plan amendment. 
All right, I don't see any comments from my colleagues or questions. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Dunn. The public hearing on this matter is scheduled for February 23rd uh, at 1.30 p.m. Councilmember Navarro, did you have something? You're just stretching. Okay, not at all. Okay, <laughs> good. Well, that's Colleagues. a tough council president, let me tell you. Colleagues, I, I'm just trying to be responsive because I, I missed some texts. Okay. Um, colleagues, I think we're going to land this plane nine minutes ahead of schedule. Thank you all for uh, everybody participating today, and we'll see you all very soon. Suspended in response to COVID-19. Bus riders should, che should check the status of their usual buses.